Tonight's keynote speaker, Dr. Simon Pete Warden, is a retired U.S. Air Force General and current director of the NASA Ames Research Center, which provides critical R&D support for the nation's aeronautics and space missions. His Green Space Initiative uses Ames remote sensing technology to implement air traffic safety, fight forest fires, and study climate change. A recognized expert on space issues, both civilian and military, Dr. Warden has authored or co-authored more than 150 technical papers in astrophysics, space science, and strategic studies. Please welcome Dr. Simon Pete Warden. I am truly honored to be here. You science fiction writers and illustrators all have inspired many of my colleagues at NASA and me to make your dreams real. I've heard countless tales from astronauts and NASA employees on how they studied math, science, and engineering in school after reading or watching science fiction. It opens our minds to possibilities. I must confess occasionally at some hazard I'm reminded of several times in high school that I had to sit in detention after I got caught reading a sci-fi paperback hidden in my history textbook. <laughs> it didn't cut mustard with the teacher when I tried to explain that I was reading that history of the future. But that is what you do. <laughs> when I was in college, I loved the film 2001, A Space Odyssey which of course was inspired by Arthur C. Clarke's 1950 short story, The Sentinel. The story influenced many to fall in love with the limitless possibilities of space exploration. The movie sparked imaginations and provided a realistic preview of what our future in space might look like. And I eventually got to meet Sir Arthur himself in Sri Lanka. He even had the zero gravity toilet instructions from the film in his guest restroom. <laughs> When 2001 A Space Odyssey premiered in 1968, living and working in space full-time was, of course, science fiction. Today, crew members are aboard the International Space Station 365 days a year, operating one of the most complex engineering projects in history. The station is helping us push the boundaries of 21st century science, technology, and engineering. Although some of the things in the film are not yet realities, some of them are in the works. For example, Although we haven't yet colonized the moon, NASA is planning to design rockets that will take us beyond low Earth orbit and into our solar system and hopefully one day maintain a presence there. Other space ventures in space, such as hotels in orbit and routine space, a tour of space travel are being planned by commercial space flight companies. Your writings and illustrations tell us that the universe is much more complicated than we think. You tell us there could be multiple universes that we can travel faster than the speed of light, and that the very fabric of space may contain limitless energy. For the last several dec decades, NASA has mounted missions to study the origin and structure of the universe. And to our surprise, the universe is much more complicated than we thought. We have uncovered evidence that the stuff of which we are made, normal matter, is a tiny percentage of what seems to be. We are indeed ghost matter. Each new mission tells us we know less about the physical universe than we thought. Of course, this is great news for job security for physicists. <laughs> I have little doubt that some of the other amazing concepts you write about may turn out to be true. Your writings inspire us to find out. Perhaps the most inspiring of all is the idea that we are not alone in the universe. Somewhere out there are other beings, other intelligences, and other civilization. These thoughts motivate our most exciting searches. How did life begin? And where else is it in the universe? And from these questions comes the ultimate one. What is the future of life in the universe? I believe that we will soon begin to get answers about the origin of life and where else it is in the universe, if anywhere. We have tantalizing evidence that life once existed and indeed may still exist on Mars. The key is water, or perhaps another liquid that exists on planetary surfaces. NASA probes are finding water everywhere, a point I will return to. Liquid water once flowed on Mars, and there is evidence that it could have flowed there within the last few millions of years. There is tantalizing evidence that there may still be life on Mars in the form of variable methane emissions. 
One possible source of methane is life. But before you start writing about Martian cows, <laughs> I should caution you that what may be there are microbes deep underground where liquid water may still exist and flow. However, in full disclosure, scientists at my center, NASA Ames, have written recent articles questioning the methane observations in their reality. Stay tuned as we discover more and more on this interesting possibility. But we are finding water at, in lots of places in our solar system. Abundance of water was found on our moon by recent NASA missions, such as the Lunar Crater Observation and Sensing Satellite, or LCROSS, which was managed by my center. There appears to be a huge liquid ocean under the kilometers of ice on the Jovian moon Europa. In Saturn's moons Enceladus has water jets indicating liquid water under the surface. Other liquids may also host life. Saturn's big moon Titan has ethane and methane rain and lakes. Some say bizarre life, possibly microbes, could exist there. One of my Ames colleagues, Dr. Chris McKay, has recently written a paper pointing out that chemical equilibrium or non-equilibrium measurements from Titan could be explained by weird life. Indeed, hold that thought that chemical non-equilibrium means life. What this means is that a self-perpetuating process, presumably life, is operating to maintain a chemical imbalance that absent life would quickly disappear. In the Earth's atmosphere, large quantities of free oxygen is just such an indication. As you all know, the search for life becomes really interesting if we can find higher level life, maybe even intelligence. This is unlikely other than on Earth in this solar system, so we are searching for other solar systems. Two years ago, we launched Kepler, the first mission capable of finding Earth-sized planets in Earth-like orbits around Sun-like stars, and find them we are. Let me play a short video with some of Kepler's results. Three, two, engine start, one, zero, and liftoff of the Delta II rocket with Kepler on a search for planets Chamber in some way building. like our own. Pretty cool, huh? <laughs> In the coming decades, NASA is planning missions that will actually determine whether planets such as Kepler is finding have water and oxygen, a discovery that we believe will be our first indication of extensive life in the universe. Most exciting of all, though, is human expansion into the universe. We are at the most exciting time in history because sometime in the next few decades, Earth life, us, will leave this planet permanently. This only happens once in history. You have written about it, and it's our task to make this real. To be sure, this is controversial, but it is our mission. We are deep in discussion with Congress, the administration, partners around the world, and most significantly with the private sector on how to do this. Will it be done by governments, ours alone, or with many others? Will the private sector do it without us? Can we help, and so forth? Some of us inspired by you are thinking further. In the past year, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, has worked with us to figure out how we might begin to build a starship to take us to those places Kepler is finding. We are figuring out how a private foundation could be set up to work over many years to do the necessary technical, social, political, and financial groundwork for this great endeavor. This is called the 100-Year Starship Project. We are planning a major conference later this year, and I hope you will all attend. Let me close by telling you that I believe that the first human off-world settlement will happen within 20 years. It may be at the poles of the moon, it may be on Mars, or even an asteroid, but it will happen. Now I'd like to show you one small step we took a year and a half ago to find places where there's water to support such a settlement.
I said at the beginning that science fiction writing and illustrating has helped inspire NASA. I also like to think that what we do at NASA has helped inspire you, that our new discoveries provide the tools to open your imagination. Or, as in the words of the contest creator, L. Ron Hubbard, science fiction is the dream that precedes the dawn when the inventor or scientist awakens and goes to his books or his lab saying, I wonder whether I could make that dream come true in the world of real science. Thank you. Thank you.